geht's los, Eric? Okay, wir fangen jetzt an. So, herzlich willkommen. Thanks everybody for coming. My name is Klaus Wannell. I'm with the group uh, Die Gemütlichen Schulplattler. Um, we were formerly, for many, many years, uh, since our founding, based in Anaheim, California, which um, conveniently um, stamed after uh, a woman named Anna, Anna, and that was our heim, Anna's home. Um, but we were forced, um, we, know her too. we weren't paying um, adequate homage to her, so they kicked us out of Anaheim and threw us in a, um, a municipality just to the north called Brea. So we are currently in Brea, California. Um, anyway, um, I'm not exactly a, um, a foreigner to the microphone, but I'm not going to use the microphone because um, those of you that know me or know what I do professionally, I stand in front of people every day of the week. Well, I don't know, Corona kind of messed that up. But I, I teach. I'm a, uh, I'm a German professor, so I'm kind of used to talking, talking to students. Um, and um, I don't need that. Um, because I'll probably talk long enough that, or, or loudly enough that people will say, what's going on in that room? Somebody's screaming and they'll come, they'll come to the door and that'd be good. Maybe they'll come in. But um, anyway, uh, first, uh, a few things. Um, this, the theme is regional differences of Leto Hosen, um, which there are regional differences. You can look at, you can honestly look at somebody's Leto Hosen um, and it is possible, I say possible, um, in some cases to determine where they come from. That said, it also means that it's also impossible to tell where they come from. Um, but we'll, we'll cover, all of, cover all those things. I prepared about 170 slides, 172 or three, um, if somebody wants to do the division, the math division, to figure out how long I should spend talking about every slide to make sure that, you know, um, we've got 120 minutes and there are 172 slides and that gives us approximately, what, 23 seconds per slide or something? I wasn't hired as a, as a math instructor. Minute 41. So I'm, I'm not particularly savvy in that category. But we are going to get started. And the focus is on Leto Hosen in places where Leto Hosen are worn. And if you think that they're worn only in Germany, guess what? You're wrong. Okay? And if you think that they're worn all over Germany, guess what? You're wrong. Because if you're up in Kiel or in Berlin and you're dressed like my friend Walter Schale here walking around uh, Kurfürst and Damm, what are people probably going to do? They'll throw things at you. But marry. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Because that's not part of their that's not part of their culture. But Lederhosen, this presentation is really focusing on Lederhosen where they are, have been traditionally worn, which is where? So in Bayern. But are they are they worn all over Bayern? If you go up to Bamberg, which is famous for its elf beer. Um, or you go to Nuremberg, which is part, and those cities are part of Franken. Is that a traditional Beinkleid? No, it's not. They have their own tucked. Um, to some extent, it's been exported there because Bavarian culture has been exported all over. I mean, look at what our Vereine in this country are doing. So it's been exported here, fought in Australia, you'll find it in in South Africa, everywhere. So, yes, they are born in Bavaria, but where else? Austria. Now I'm doing this like I'm teaching. Jesus. Right, so in Österreich, in Österreich but are, are they born all over Österreich? Where are they not born in Österreich? Anyone know? Please? No. Because, does anyone know the term for somebody that makes, they don't, besides using the word Maker of Lederhosen, Lederhosen maker. Well, you could say in German, you could say Lederhosen Bacher, but you could also say the word what? Sekla. Because the Sekla was from the word Sak. Sak was a purse. And historically, they made purses of leather. And eventually, that skill that they had um, was extended and it diversified so that they started making legwear made of leather. So we use the word sekla in a place that sells Lederhosen 
is what we would call a seclarite. So if you go to a seclarite, primarily they're going to sell lederhosen. But they're also going to want to make money selling other knickknacks, so maybe they'll have a few Trachtenhemden, or they might have, you know, Strümpfe, or other knickknacks, so that they're, um, you know, they have other ways of bringing in um, a little bit of income. And they also make, uh, <coughs> well, what is what is that walk? Anyone know what a walk is? It's not something that you break you broke windows with when you when you were kids. It's a skirt. So if we put the word leda in front of rock, we get a leda rock, right? Because they make leather skirts. They can do embroidery on leather skirts. They don't sell as much of those, but that at least gives um, women that are interested in wearing something made of leather the opportunity to purchase something. Okay, anyway, enough of that. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get started. Um, some of these I gloss over. Um, some of these I'll probably have to read because um, you may not be able to see it from where you're seated. Um, and feel free during any point in this um, presentation to stop, to have me repeat something, to ask a question, to have other people from the audience contribute, um, because everybody brings some degree of knowledge. Okay, there's something that you know, and it's possible that um, you, the other participants here are not aware of that. So we, we really appreciate anything that you can use to um, augment the presentation and, and make it more interesting. Also, I am presenting information to you that I accessed. It's not complete information. It's not 100% accurate information. Um, but it was things that I was able to find out by scouring the internet by making calls to people in Germany, which I did up until yesterday at the hotel. I was talking to the Vorstand um, of a group that is in um, Kreit. Does anyone know where Kreit is? Anyone familiar with the Tegante area? There's a locality called Kreit, and it's a very, very interesting area because they are completely different from all of the surrounding Upper Bavarian areas that were in Lederhosen. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out why, because even when I talked to this person yesterday, he didn't know exactly. Um, so anyway, we'll cover that. Um, what you see here is um, just a kind of like a random um, putting together mosaic of Lederhosen that come from a variety of areas. Um, and what says there, Kurz are Lederhosen, so you should know the word Kurz, Kurz, Lam, right? I could teach you German just by doing, I mean, just by movements, um, using realia, and you will, you'll walk away from here knowing not only more about Lederhosen, but you'll probably know a little bit more about German, and maybe you'll want to take a club. Hey, I got, I got a great, I, I can promote from my online class in the fall at Fullerton College in Fullerton, California. You don't even have to be a resident there. You just have to be interested in taking an online course. You could take, you could fill out my one-on-one -on -one class and it won't get canceled. Because um, <laughs> my in-person classes work, thanks to, uh, thanks to COVID. Um, anyway, um, yes, we have, there is a variety in here. Any, any of these look familiar? What do you see most of here? Which variety would you see the most of? Bidersh, and which one's a Bidersh? Definitely the bottom three. Right? On the bottom, right. And all of those on the bottom have a unique kind of Stikerei. Stikerei is embroidery or stitching. Does anyone know what type of Stikerei that is? Well, don't know the type. It's called Platt Stikerei. And Platt, it's like, oh, Snaps for Platt? No. Platt Deutsch. Oh, okay. Well, Platt is also low. In, if you go to North Germany, they speak Platt Deutsch, right? Which is low German. Very close to English, right? Instead of saying Apfel, they say Apfel. Yeah? Okay. Anyway, Platzstickerei, the main difference, and all those above have another kind of Stickerei, which is what? Please? Machine? Get out of here! No, I'm serious, leave. Um, no. It's what we call relief stitching. Can it be done with a machine? Yes. Can Platzstickerei, all those things that you see down below, be done with the machine? Yes. 
Can people here tell the difference? No. Yeah, you should be able to. You should be able to. Um, and perhaps by the, you know, by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to tell the difference between something that was machine manufactured versus something that was created with, with somebody's hands. So the bottom is a plastic that covers the surface of the leather. So the um, what we call the zekla zaida, okay, and it's the it's the yarn, okay, that they embroider with that covers the surface. The relief stitching is an outline of the design, and what the difference is is when they stick the needle through one side and pull it out the other side, um, it creates an embossed look. So it bulges, creates a bulge, right? So if you look, I mean, I'll show you these later, but um, you know, here's an, here's an example. And you could look, for example, at this. This is all embossed stitching. If it's done with a machine, what the machine does is it goes clear, clearly through from the, from the top surface, goes through the bottom surface. But what happens when you do it by hand? They do the top surface, and it stays within the leather, it comes out again. It does not go through to the bottom. Okay, so moving on. More, okay, more examples. It's, I wish we had a better quality for the pictures, because you would be able to see some of the, okay, some of the actual detail, which is, you know, sad. Um, Make you more appreciative. Okay, and of course these are well before we add kotze, and these are known as right. They're known as bund hose. Okay, so anyone know who made them? If you're familiar with what the products of Zekla look like, then you'll be able to tell. It's like you'll immediately be able to look at the one in the middle and say that one was made by. Has anyone been to? Baptist Garden. Okay, Baptist Garden is in, is in which part of Bavaria? It's in the south eastern part, and there there they are there are two Zeppelin there. One's name is Stangassinger, who's in the he has a son and he took over from his father, so it's a third generation. And then there is Eigner, Engelbert Eigner who also has sons, and he's in the second generation. They learn together from the first Dangasinga, and they hate each other. <laughs> yeah. okay. It's kind of like, it's sort of like, when you leave today, look up the history, for example, of um, the two brothers, one who made, what do they call the shoes that have three stripes on them? Adidas. Adidas. But the brother made Puma. Originally, his name was Rudolf Dasla, and he went Adi Dasla. And so originally, the Pumas were called Ruda. It didn't sound good, so they changed it to Pum Puma. They hated each other. Even in death, they're buried on opposite sides of the river. Okay, so I, I don't know if they're want to, be, want to be buried on opposite sides of the Batsman of the mountain in Baptist God. Who knows? So anyway, we have Bundhosen here. These are some Bundhosen from Austria. You might see some differences. For example, if you look over at the one on the left, you notice this. some of the motifs. You see what? What kind of motifs do you see there? Well, here, can you see? So if you look here, then you see tira, right? Animals, right? So like, okay, here's a hirsch, there's a deer, that's a gums, a goat, right? So you know gums is a goat, gums spot. Right? Hirsch, Hirsch leather, deer leather. Um, that's not from Bavaria. That's not typical for Bundhosen and Vader in Bavaria, but it is typical um, for an area in Austria that we'll talk about later on. Yep. What? What kind of stick are they? Yes. And that's interesting too, because yes, there are Bundhosen that have no stick And there are certain places where you'll see they don't have stick on in them. Okay? Particularly in areas that were, let's say, socio or economically left, okay, more deprived, so poor areas, because shtikarai is what? Expensive. It's an adornment. And if you want a lot of it, then you need a lot of get it, right? You need a lot of money for it, right? 
So and even though people today are more affluent, um, that um, uh, modesty that was exhibited in Tuck before in Lederhosen became the tradition. So if you go to if you go to places like you know Dinabayan or particularly in Algoy, if you go to Algoy, the Bundhosen have no shtikarai. If they're the same, they haven't changed that. Now what? Oh, I thought it was my wife calling. Sorry. She's not going to see this presentation. It's being recorded. Okay. Anyway, here are some of the questions that you might. Okay, you're not going to be able to read this, so I'm going to have to read this to you. But these are some possible questions that you may have. Okay, that may be sort of percolating, percolating in your head. What do they cost? What accounts for wide differences um, in, in what you pay for that? What should you buy? And specifically, for what purpose? Like, do you want to buy a $3,000 pair of Lado hose in the beautifully stitched, and then you go out and do some price for that leg? Probably not, because then you're, you're like destroying your, you're destroying your investment, right? Um, how long have they been around? How many styles are there? What are some of the differences? What makes them different uh, from one another? Um, how long does it take to order them? Uh, are there differences in quality? And how can you distinguish what's poor workmanship from good workmanship? So that if you know if you're considering buying them, like, you know, where would you go? I mean, is quantity everything? If you look at some of these later holes and you see if there's a ton of you know stitching on it, and you say, I want those. Um, versus somebody with less shtikarai, less embroidery, uh, but there may be um, quality differences between the two. And I, I mean, I've been dealing with these, these matters for a long, long time, so I see it immediately. And I always think, oh, everybody sees it. That's, it's not true. Um, anyway, oh, then, how long will they last? Usually they should last longer than we will last. <laughs> okay. Um, are there regional differences in styles? Yeah, you bet. So anyway, um, you can delve into the history, and the focus is not on the history, but I always like starting to talk um, by saying a few things about what influenced Lena Hosen. Uh, and if you go back several hundred years uh, from the Spanish, there was this one garment which was called a trunk hosa, and you can see this guy on the right wearing it. Um, and this was kind of adopted by people that, wore, that lived in the Tuxatal and in Silatal. And these people, for their day, um, were the ones that were bold and daring, and just, you know, they, you know, they were the trendsetters, and they exposed skin, which back in those days was a, okay, was a taboo. And so they started wearing them, and it spread. Spread through the rest of Austria, into the Steiermark, into the, okay, into Bavaria. Um, and then later on, starting in the 17, 1700s, um, leather trousers started, you know, they started being dyed in various colors, black notably. Um, and then they, you know, they kind of spread like wildfire. Um, some of these pictures you can see if you look on the right here. Does anyone recognize that top? It's Tirol, but Tirol is huge, and, and there is huge differences in the top even within Tirol. But this is very, okay, this is very obviously Toxatal, Sinatal, especially when you look at what the men are wearing here. This red garment, which is really a vest, and it's what they call a Brustfleck, but that is very, very typical for Sinatal um, and Toxatal. Okay, um, anyway, Lederhosen initially came from breaches, the collect. Okay, so they were um, worn by the French in the 17, okay, 1700s. They went below the knee. They had buttons, okay, buttons going down, usually three or four button buttons. They had leda bando, leather bands that could, okay, that could, you know, be tightened. And so, what did they do with leda hose? They just said, "We're going to use leather." Okay, um, and eventually, um, there's they don't have. Um, an exact forgänger or predecessor of short lederhosen, 
um, other than to say that eventually as people became more daring uh, and bolder, they showed more of their skin. And so the bunt hosen uh, became shorter and shorter until they said, we're just gonna have short ones. And you, if you look at these short ones and you see that there are buttons here, what in tarnations are the buttons for? They're decorative. They don't, they don't serve a purpose, okay? But they remain there. And in Austria, in many, many areas, um, whereas in Bavaria, you have bundle. So if you see the bundle, do these bundle have a function? They do work. They work. What are they supposed to do? Keep the short over there, tight. Yeah, they have another function. And the, and the reason is that in 1883, when um, uh, Colonel Sanders opened up, wait, it wasn't Colonel Sanders. What happened in 1883? <laughs> what was it? That's a big year in Bavaria. What happened? The Trachtenverein. And who was, does anyone remember the gentleman's name? That Josef Vogel. And which area did he start the very first talking about? What was the name of the city? Was it, here, I'll give you, I'll give you four choices, because I always do this. Was it A, Wuppertal? Was it two, Walla Walla? Was it three, um, Berchtesgaden? Or was it four, Bayerischzell? So it wasn't Walla Walla, huh? No. So, right, it was in Bayer, okay, it was in Bayerischzell. Okay, so they started, they started that in 1883, and that, okay, and that spread like wildfire, okay? Um, anyway, um, the short later hosen were so popular that they weren't even scared off when the colder months came. They still wanted to wear them. But it snows there, and so what did they do to protect their legs? They wore what we call Schneestrümpfe, snow socks. They got pulled up, and with the bundle that are on the lederhosen, they connected. So that's why you have the bundle. That today serve absolutely, and I bet none of you have ever worn snow socks, Schneestrümpfe with, with lederhosen, have you? Probably not. But that is something you can consider for the future. I don't know to say. Okay. Anyway. Continuing talking about some okay some historical facts, has anyone ever been to Benedict Boyan? In Benedict Boyan, which is Nova Bayern, there is the Centrum für Trachtengewand, which is the center for Tracht. The word Gewand, or we shorten in, in uh, Bayern, it becomes Gewand, right? Neuter word, so you see das Gewand, okay? Bodisches Gewand, Bavarian, right? Bavarian dress. Um, the Centrum für Trachtengewand uh, has um, samples of actual garments. This pair of Lego hosen, which the, the picture and the um, yeah, quality of, of the projection here is such that it's not going to do it justice. But I, I'm afraid if we turn them off, we're, yeah. Well, anyway, these are from 1810. They're over 200 years old. They were never worn. They faded because the Stickerei initially was blue. But they, they are the oldest pair in this condition. Um, those, okay, that's known to exist. Um, and the Zekla, where they don't want to um, His last name is Moza. Um, if you've ever been to Miesbach before, anyone ever been to Miesbach before? There's a Zekla. His last name is Moza. I can't. Moza is a very common name. So there's, you could go there and say, hey, was, was Anton Baptist Moza your, you know, was your ancestor? And they say, oh yeah, he definitely was. Might be you know, a bunch of BS. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, what do we have here? Short development of later Moza, regional differences. Um, so just some basic points, because I really don't want to read all this, but Tracht is ever-changing. Um, it even changes with, have, has the Tracht within any of your groups changed over the years? Definitely. Do you like see things that other groups wear and say, I don't know where that? Yeah, I mean, we all do that. And so it, it, it's fluid, it, it is a fluid um, 
thing. It, it changes um, as, as we change with it. Um, but the thing, and the, so the thing about it is people wanted to show up. And that's kind of how talk developed from something that was a simple uh, garment that was worn by foresters um, and, um, and hunters. Um, and so when the talk in the vehicle, the talk movement started, um, people were really excited about this. And they said, we want to make it prettier. We want, okay, we want more bells and whistles on it. And so that's how, particularly in Bavaria, they started adding, uh, you know, adding more shtikarai to it, um, putting hunting motifs on it, you know, oak leaves and ivy, and are there any other, do you know of any other symbols that are on Bavarian style Lederhosen? Adler. Adler, which are the warthogs? No, they're, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Eagles, um, if you order one at Halloween, do they make it with, with spiders and cats and orange? No, no, no. I always thought that would be kind of cool to do, but you don't even know where it would go. Okay, anyway, it's interesting um, because the, the talk in the Vigo, um really attracted a lot of people that were not even Bavarian. Even at that time, um, in Bavaria, there were a lot of people that were considered Gastarbeiter. Guess workers. A lot of them came from like places in Czechoslovakia, and they liked purchasing these. And they were the ones that partially that were responsible for having the Lado Ladohosen adorned, you know, with more color, with more okay, with more things that were symbolic of of the surroundings, which is why, you know, you want to stand up and show them because this has look at all this stuff on there. Those people are responsible for why these look like what they do today. Thank you. Okay, look, that's the issue. All right. <laughs> um, anyway, if you're interested in, if you didn't know, data hosen have parts. Right, just like, you know, parts is parts. Um, we all have parts. But it's kind of interesting to know which part is being referred to, especially if you're buying one so that you can say, can you do this area? Can you do the, that area in this, okay, in this style, or at that. Um, but basically, um, and yeah, these, they're German terms, but hey, you know, whatever. You have this area, which we call a Latzbund, and the Latz is like the flat, and the Latzbund is just this kind of, this horizontal top piece. Then we have this, sort of this part below, these sides, which we call the Leistung, the Leistung called Messersack or Messertasche. Um, and what else do we have? Now, this part, Zekla knot. Does anyone know what a knot is? It's a seam. But what is special about a Zekla knot? Decorative. It is decorative. But there's another kind of knot, another kind of seam, which is what? It's a tailor's knot. Schneider knot. Köder knot. And it's different because it's executed differently. It's turned in. You don't see it. So in a lot of okay, in professions, um, as a zekla, they weren't permitted to use them. They had, they had their own special knot, which now you're used to. Um, it's attractive. Most people think it gives you know gives later holes in a very rock, kind of rustic appearance. Um, this is kind of the, this is the same thing, but um, it just identifies uh, a few other areas. So you can look down here, and you see that these. Four buttons here are, are knöpfe, so we have knöpfe, which are buttons, um, and then designs, certain designs have their own names. So whatever appears down in this corner here has the word ecke, which is corner, and then the word bluma, right? Even though, I mean, bluma is what? It's a flower, but they're not all, it's not exclusively flowers, right? We do have, okay, so we do have hand motifs, um, you can see there's a little, there's a little guy here that has a, you know, has a gun, and there's a fox, and there's an alahan. Um, and so this is what we call Ecklumen, and then this area, that's identified as a Latz, and what is below the Latz typically we call Ecklumen. Or rather, yeah, they're called uh, Latzklumen, sorry, Latzklumen. And then on the sides, you see these are what we call, uh, those are, Stepnete or 
Sia eta, sia, sia is, de is decorative, and sia not is a decorative scene. It's not a real scene, it's a decorative scene. So it's all done for decoration, um, and then you could actually count them. Does, does anyone know how many you can count on here? You have one, two, three, four. You have four decorative scenes on this side. You have four decorative scenes on the other side, which are actually right here. Plus this one seam in the middle, and you get how many seams? You get nine, you get a total of nine seams. Run the middle, four on each side, those are nine seams. And that has a specific name, we call it a noinatike, which is a nine seamed pair of lederhosen, specific to Austria, but to be even more specific, uh, you'd find it more in the area of the Salzkammergut. The Salzkammergut, which is in, in, in Salzburger Land, Oberösterreich, um, in Steiermark. Right. Okay. And of course, that last piece on the bottom there, which you see a bussel. And the bussel, you see the down below, and I'm wearing these. This is also the Zeklanat, and this is something which is also particular to Lederhosen in the Steiermark, but not for every area. This is a bussel um, that is typical for this, okay, for this side. Hmm? Oh, we'll talk about that more later. Okay, so. Um, We've already talked about the Zeklanat, so I don't need, even need to show you this. Um, we will talk about Lederhosen in Tirol, which is very interesting. Has everybody here at some point has seen uh, Tracht from Tirol, right? If somebody walked in here wearing a Tiroler Tracht, would you notice it? Yes. Is there any Trachtenverein in Gauverband Nordamerika that wears a, start, a type of Tiroler Tracht? Anyone know what Tracht it is? Or which group? Which, which one is it? Vancouver, exactly. And the style that they, okay, that they emulate is known as Viptalatat. And of course a Tal, we all know what a Tal is, because it's in a lot, please? Valley. It's a valley, right. Okay, anyway, some characteristics are a lot of the groups, okay? A lot of Tratla in Tirol wear Buntos. Does anyone wear Quartzer Lederhosen? Absolutely. There are a lot of Plattler Gruppen because they are, um, has anyone here ever worn Bundhosen to Schuhplattelin? If you had a choice to wear Quartzer, short one or, or Bundhosen, which one would you choose? Right. Probably the short one. Yeah, for obvious reasons. You have a lot more Bewegungsfreiheit, right? Freedom, okay, freedom of movement. All right, anyway, um, when it comes to Stickerei, as um, he was saying, there's a lot less of it. But of course, that doesn't, that doesn't hold true for every area in Tirol. You do have um, areas that, you know, where one goes and with Stikadai. If you go to Suti, okay, if you go to Suti, well, for example, some of the, some of the areas that wear Bundhosen have Stikadai on them. But they don't know where Bundhosen. Some don't even wear Lederhosen. The Lederhosen are actually made of loaded instead. Um, so anyway, we have some pretty pictures. I'm not going to spend too much time looking at them. Um, but we will kind of look at some of the styles. This is okay. So this is Tirol. This is Viptal. Um, oh, here's Viptal again. Who's the jerk in the middle? Okay. Anyone know the guy on the right? Tony. Tony. There's Tony. Anyone know the girl on the left? Brenda. No. No. That's Tanya. There you go. So anyway, right, Tan is on the table. Tan is on the left. So we can move to Tzilatal, and of course, if you look at Tzilatal, um, I don't even think, that's a no kind of little hose. They're not even wearing little hose, right? Um, but here they are. You can tell, because the guy on the right there has a lot kind of sticker eye, right? There's no stitching, no stitching. Um, mix, right? Nothing there. Okay, very plain. Um, but one thing you might notice about Tracht is where one particular component um, is very sparing, you might have something else which is much more ostentatious. Does anyone know what maybe the most expensive part of the Sinatala Tracht is? It's the belt. And the belt, the word for belt, yeah, we can call it a ransin. It's usually a fedekiel. Ransen, so it's made with um, quill feathers. 
from peacocks, and that's that's where the money goes. Okay. So other okay, other areas here is Kufstein, the Kaiser. I'm sorry you can't see all the all the detail. There's imps, but you know, they're pretty. Aven, this is Aven of Appenzay. One of the interesting things about this area, even though it's not, I mean, I really shouldn't be talking about it because it doesn't, it's not made of it but it is Aransen because, um, oh, did I lose the slide? Yeah, I guess I must have lost the slide. Um, but they are particularly big, very large, um, compared to other areas. So if you went to Salzburg, Salzburg, their Aransen tend to be somewhat smaller there. The, and we're talking about the area that's called Blattel, and a plato, does anyone know what a plato is? Plato is the same word, what grows on a, tr a leaf, right? And so plato, a plato, the, okay, that front part is called a plato, right? And that tends to be a little, okay, a little um, smaller there. So, al Yeah. Well, that was al right, that was al but that wasn't easy. And then we go to Ertztal, and Ertztal also has very particular talk, particularly, okay, in particular, these, um, this is a Schutzen, okay, uh, Schutzenverein, and they have very particular Jopen that all have this, um, this hell here, uh, which is very, okay, very distinctive, and you can see they're, they don't listen, okay, um, pretty plain. Um, and we kind of move on to Innsbruck, und the Inntal, Kotza, there's okay, so that's a Plattler group, obviously, they dance, and the Innsbruck, and then we go down to Südtirol, right? And everyone knows that Südtirol is, why don't they speak German there, by the way? Because they all studied it, and they, they liked it more than Italian? Uh, they were part of Austria. Please? They were annexed. They were annexed after the Vietnam War? Yeah. World War One. exactly. Okay. Um, Anyway, we'll see some Südtirol adopted. So again, here are people from another Schützenverein. I always like this because if you notice the Fida, that is a, it's right, it's okay, which is a Fal, right? A Fal Fida. Okay. Um, so in Südtirol, to some extent, some areas, um, uh, unlike the normal Lederhosen flap, some of them have an asymmetrical, um, flat and slip, okay, and slip fastenings. Uh, there is no ornamentation. If you go to Meran, they actually have this thin cord of purple silk that's laid in a few loops um, just below the pipe pocket um, and a pipe seam where there's there's no stitching. So, no, they don't hose in there. You can see what this uh, gentleman in the front is wearing. No, they don't hose in there. Of course, you want to mention if you're going to talk about Sutiwal. Does anyone, anyone familiar um, that can succinctly tell us who Andreas Hofer was and why he was significant? Against Bach? Why was he fighting the Bavarians? Because who was pushing the Bavarians to fight against the people in Tirol? Those darn French. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, I'm not, I'm not even going to read this, um, because you can find out more yourself about Andreas Hofer. There's even a song about him, if you want to learn the Andreas Hofer lead. Um, but again, these are, this is a vine guitar, right? But, you know, it's tended to grapes, because if you go to Südtirol, they drink wine, right? They can feel the wine within Südtirol. There's Meran, again, and more Meran. Um, and this is by Bolzen, okay, it goes to Bolzen. And again, I'm just kind of glossing over because there are more things that we'll talk about. You can see the pretty pictures um, and see that some of these wood poles in have their eye. Um, here they wear stiefel, and stiefel again are wristbands, right? Or what is a, what is a stiefel? Boots. It's something you pour beer in and drink out of. Yeah, yeah. boots. Can hold three liters. It's a boot. There you go. Okay. Um, and then we get to the zanta. Um, and I have a, I, I have a particular um, love for the Zantal because Zantal is really one of the areas, if you're familiar with Fedekirchtikarai or um, with um, 
quill feather embroidery, um, that's where it was really, really made into an art going back well over 100 years. Um, this was old Santana talk where they actually did used to wear, they weren't made of um, they were made of loden. Um, but it changed over time. So does, any, does anyone know what the top in Zantal today looks like for men? This is what it looks like. So what happened to the pants? They got long, they got long right? Um, got very long, they made a thick um, loaded. Um, but the one thing that he held on to, of course, was this Fedekish Tikarai, and if you're ever interested in ordering Fedekish Tikarai, you really want to get it from probably one of the two best, in my opinion, makers. It's Familia Tala. Um, and of course, Tala is an interesting word because you spend them every day. German currency a long time ago, the denomination was a Tala, which that's how we have the word dollar. So you walk away from here with a lot of um, kind of trivia related details that you might find interesting. Um, then we can, okay, we can look at the Finchgau, Finchgau, which is also in Suti Hall, and they do wear a Bundhose. And then we get to Salzburg Land. So now we're kind of in, okay, another area in Austria. And I think they were dressed up for Gashton? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, they were dressed up for Gashton. And we're not going to talk about Gashton because that's another few hours. Okay. Um, now, what we will talk about Lederhosen in Salzburg Land. Because this is kind of where it gets interesting. If you look at this pair, what do you notice that's different, that you may not have seen before? Please? Right, okay, so you see, there's no, there is no flap, okay? The flap, that part that we call the Latzbund, there is no Latzbund. And that is very, very characteristic for Salzburg and Latz. We're not talking about just the city of Salzburg, but areas that are surrounding it, like Pongal, Pinskal. Um, and another characteristic that you cannot see um, well, typically on these you don't really have sticker high, you don't have ekflumen, so you don't have anything on the legs. But there's also another seam that you don't can't see from the front. You have a bundle on there either. Well, we have bundle, okay, you have data bundle, but there's also a knot. There's also a, a seam that you can't see. And there it is. Do you see that seam? Okay. Now you could you could use the vulgar term called an ash knot, <laughs> right? Um, but it's also but it has various names. It's called a gazes knot, gazes, which is rump. It's one of the measurements you need to take if you order a pair. Um, it's also called a tela knot, tela, which is a plate. Um, and it was actually taken over uh, as influenced by riding okay, riding pants from Hungarians. Okay. Um, but it stuck, and initially it was with Bundhosen, but then, and you can see it on the back there, this, this is a fairly ornate example um, of these, and here's some more, um, and this is very, okay, a very ornate example, um, and I always like showing this because this is a, this was a Zetla Familia um, that goes back seven generations, um, so I don't know, it's that like well, that's well over 200 years. The name of the family is Zant. They originally came from Leoben, and Leoben is a city in, let's see, let's not have the person from Austria in my group spit it out immediately and see if anybody else knows where Leoben is. It's, is Leoben right next to um, uh, Hamburg? Or No, okay, it's actually in, it's in Österreich, in Steiermark, right? Yeah. So Leoben, right? Leoben is in Steiermark. They eventually ended up, okay, in Selamsee, which is okay, uh, in Pinskal. And one of the notable characteristics, if you look at the lats, what do you notice about? Four buttons. Four buttons is a characteristic which most people that know Lederhosen no, it came from Zant. Now, does that mean all Lederhosen with four buttons came from Zant? No, because there are other characteristics which help you identify, identify the source. You could look at the type of stitching, how it was, how it was executed.
executed, um, the cuts, the tailoring, all of those are important uh, you know, characteristics in considering okay, where it came from, the region, who made it, and so on. Um, now, this one is also a South Spokane, South Spokane you know, mostly because you see this seam, obviously, on the back. You see, you see that, um, unlike Bavarian Lederhosen that have um, bundle, that are, you know, wool, okay, they're made of wool, are some material, those are actually, and that's very common for Salzburg, those are Leder bundle, right? I can't tell you whether they use those for snow in the winter, but it seems like it, it could make sense, um, and they would be sturdy enough to hold up Schneeschluck, you know, snow. Uh, socks if you have it, okay? Uh, again, here is another example. Is any of this stitching, this relief stitching necessary? No, but <coughs> if you want to show off, I mean, if you have the money, right, I mean, you, you know, might want to flock it. Um, so here's Pinsko, Salzburg, okay, Salzburg, Salzburg Land, here's kind of another, okay, another example. But these were made by a Zeckler that doesn't even live in Austria. So what does that tell you about Zeckla? If you go to Bavarian Zeckla, do they only make Bavarian style Lederhosen? No, because they want customers. And so if they have somebody that says, I want you to make me an Austrian style, can you do that? And if they have the capabilities of doing that, they'll probably say yes. Now, can you go, the, go to them with any kind of uh, request and ask them to make something for you? No. No, because they will also consider what is traditionally what is traditionally correct. So I know of one Zekla who's in the Steiermark who makes these kind. And he had somebody that went to him and said, I want you to make me these kind, but I want the I want that the Ashnat, right? On it. Okay, so that played on the back. And you know what he told them? No. Because you are, what are you doing? You are mixing two entirely different styles. Um, and so th there are those that um, are very dedicated to upholding and passing down that tradition and not allowing it to be, what's the word for it? Kitchen? Yeah, so you just think about kitchen. They, yeah. they don't, I mean, it's not, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's not to be made fun of or joked about or anything like that. Um, so, yeah. So moving along, this is, okay, this, again, a Pinsko from South Spoken area that has all those same characteristics. Although this one has, can you tell what kind of buttons are, are on the bottom there? What's the material used for those buttons? Because buttons are different. Yeah, okay, right. Gewei, which is also, what is Gewei? Hirschhorn. Yeah, it's, well, it's, yeah, it's Hirschhorn. Okay, it's Hirschhorn. And those are very, okay, those are very specific to certain areas. Do they use those in Bavaria? Sure, yeah. Use them in Bavaria, use them in Austria, but they're not used everywhere in Austria. There's some places that definitely do not, okay, definitely do not use them. Here's a Bodenhose, same thing from Salzburg. Now we get to, sorry, but personally it's my favorite area. Um, and this is the Salzkammergut, and the Salzkammergut again uh, is in Oberösterreich, you'll never see the map. Salzburgerland, and of course, the Steiermark, and which governor, movie actor, came from the Steiermark? <laughs> yeah, Hans Schwarzenegger. What's, where did he come from? Todd. So yes, if you, okay. So next time when you go watch Netflix, if you haven't watched this documentary, which is really, really interesting, yeah, go watch it, because they show some pictures of Todd. Anyway, what you see up here are very character, okay, very representative examples of Kotze Lederhosen in the Steiermark. And how are they different from um, Bavaria? What's the biggest difference? The color of the leather. Well, you can, I mean, they're brown. Can, they're very, the they're color of le brown. leather is less, okay, is less important because in Bavaria today you can get any color you want. Yeah, but you could also get a Pakistan. This is true, but but if you go to um, you know there are plenty of Zekla in Bavaria that will get a request to do their you know their Lederhosen. Um, you can get light brown, brown. Um, so what, whatever the tanner, the Gerba, is capable of making, they will dye it okay in a traditional color. And any black Lederhosen, they're made of Hirsch leather. 
after several years of use, what are they going to look like? They're going to look like brown, or they'll even get lighter. They will even get lighter than that. They will lose their color over time. Um, the stitches and the buttons. The stitching. And what kind of stitching, what kind of embroidery was that again? Oh, it's right. This, so this is relief stitching. You haven't given us the German name yet. What's that? You haven't given us the German name yet. Stepperei. Right. So you can call it Steppstickerei, Gelieft, okay, Gelieftstickerei. And this is used pretty much exclusively, uh, exclusively in Austria. Will you find those kind of Lederhosen with Platschtisch there? No. Well, I mean, for the most part, no. Are there? Just a whole scheme of teaching. I always say that there, there is, um, there's always an exception to the rule. Always. 99% of the time, it sticks to the rule. There's always that 1% where there's not adherence to that rule. And you'll, you'll find the same. Find the same goes with this. Anyway, we talked about the Sals Kevin Boots. You already know where it is. But one of the most important things are sentences um, regarding Lederhosen. And you're, you're going to have to like learn a, maybe a little bit of German or Bavarian. Um, is the sentence here where it says, So wie deine Lederhosen, wie sag die Wurst jetzt? Zeig mir deine Lederhosen. Show me your Lederhosen. And I'll show you the world. Ich zeig dir die Welt. And ich sage dir, wo du herkommst. I'll tell you where you come from. And what does that mean? Based on the appearance and what I'm looking at, I can tell you where you're from. Okay? Um, now, Lederhosen uh, are distinctly different from the Greek Salzburg, so there is no telenaut, so that, okay, that one seam that goes across the butt doesn't, okay, doesn't exist there. It's not a tradition. Um, the buttons typically, typically are made of cow heart. Typically. Are there exceptions to the rule? Some of them like Hirschhorn, okay, which is deer horn. But the tradition in Perkinga and Gustavo Steiermark um, is going to be cow horn. And if you go to other parts of Salzkammerboot, Upper Austria, over Österreich, you'll see that there is much more deer horn being used um, for the buttons. Zeckler are typically capable of making a wide variety of styles, okay, from neighboring, you know, localities. Um, of course, I'd like to mention Hetz Hetzel. Johann, who was, he was considered the father of Scheidemann and Hacht, was later adopted by um, Emperor Franz Josef. Trot was based on clothes for the hunt, and it had a very, very big influence on the top of the Salzkammerboot. Um, and he was really responsible for that kind of gray, green topped, making its great breakthrough um, in that area. So you could see that a lot of it, a lot of it was green. What I was unable to bring, because I had to come from California, I already had a carry-on, I had to pay extra for that in a huge suitcase, and I didn't bring my, you know, my entire wardrobe with me, but I could bring a hat because I could only get one hat to the, you know, to the hat holder because the, the crown on the one hat was too you know, too high, and I couldn't bring my yope, which was in green, but they displayed those colors very, okay, very nicely. You'll see other pictures. Um, here, if you look down below on the right, what do you see? Does anyone know what those are? Those are motifs for doing the shtikarai, or, okay, the, um, the ekblumen, okay, on the, uh, on the leohose. And I think these are, yeah, I mean, these go back to, like, 1840. Um, now, when we talk about the Salzkammerboot, I love talking about this area because within a few kilometers, um, there are three localities where the Lederhosen are distinctively different. And that's where we go back to that one sentence. Show me your Lederhosen, tell you where you're from. Um, and this just kind of helps us. This slide will help you count the seams. Um, so you know how to identify everything, but we've kind of already talked about it. But I do like to talk, I do want to mention this one area that I didn't talk about, which is because it's kind of a, a funny name, and that's this, and it has the word Hasen Tanz. Does anyone know what a Hasen is? A rabbit. It's a rabbit, and Tanzen, of course, so that's the rabbit dance. Uh, and that's a term that's used for, if you order, if you get a pair that has nine seams, and here you actually do see the nine seams, one, two, three, four, when you get a nine seam pair, 
this automatically comes with it, unless you see it on the And that's, that is the, uh, the, the rabbit dance embroidery, thousand times. Um, and there's another one, but it's not, but it's more on Fedekisch sticker high, and it's called Laufen der Hund. What is a Laufen der Hund? Running dog. Laufen der Hund. So if you have Fedekisch sticker high, a Ranzen, it's possible that you would see it there. Okay, this is seven, okay, seven seamed. Um, and it just, you know, just helps you count. Um, now, we're going to talk about various styles. This style is a Grundelseer style. And again, we're talking about these three different styles of Lederhosen. And what is unique about this one is you see that the, okay, that the color of the bottoms of the legs, there's, no, there's nothing different, right? I mean, everything, it's all in the same color, right? It's all in the same color from the top to the bottom. We call this the Abschluss. Okay, the Farbe is schwarz, the Unten is all schwarz, right? Everything, okay, everything is black. That's characteristic of Grundelsee. If you go to Bad Alsee, which is a few kilometers away, what do you notice about the bottoms of the legs? It's a light, okay, it's a light edging, which we call Einfassel, okay? It's a weiss in the Helle Einfassel, okay, a light edging there. That's particular for Bad Alsee. Uh, and then if we go to Ad I'll say, what do you see here that's different here? The bristle. So this is the primary characteristic. This knot, okay, so this seam here is what makes in Ad I'll say of Lederhosen Ad I'll So if I show you this one, now you've seen all three. What style is this? This is Ad I'll say because it has, right, it has this down below. Okay, so now, right, now you've learned something. Um, and again, these are other, okay, these are further, okay, further examples. This is another pair that I have that I didn't, okay, that I didn't bring, bring along. But this is actually, I showed this to another Zekla and he said it's wrong. And do you know why it's wrong? No, that's... This, this one was fine. If it's an ad it's 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 correct. This one is correct. But in addition, it has this at the bottom, and that is what is not traditionally correct. Even though this family has seven generations, okay, but that's how they've already always done it in the family. So, okay, I didn't okay. Um, I didn't argue with the man. Okay. Now here we have. This is. A Bundhose, right? Okay. So same, okay, same style. Um, and of course, this is a Lederhosen dynasty from the Tsang family, so I figured I would in, okay, include it. Um, this Lederhosen family has made, made like leather breeches for now King Charles of England. Um, for a lot of what we call, you know, Provinenta, okay, but famous, you know, famous people. Um, Prince, I think Prince Louis, uh, Louis Pult of, uh, of Bavaria, or Prince Ludwig, or um, I forget, I mean, you know, 40 years ago or something. Okay, and in some of these you actually see the picture of the Zekla, so um, this is Sepp Klein. Sepp Klein is in the, okay, he's in the Steiermark. Um, and he learned from his predecessor, which was the Hirschmann family that did it for four generations. And typically, um, all of the design templates that allow them to do the, allow them to do the, um, the stitching are on paper. They're templates. Now, what happens when a Zekla gets too old? He gives it to his apprentice, and then it gets carried. If, if, he doesn't have his own sons or daughters. It goes on to somebody that learned from him, so it keeps getting handed down. Um, he doesn't have anybody in his family, and he didn't have anybody that he taught that stuck around, and he's going to quit in three years, so I just figured I'd ask if anyone was interested. You want, to, you want to take over? I, I just have a question. Yeah. What is the Steiermark? I don't know what that is. What is the Steiermark? It is a province, a province in Austria. 
And the capital of the Steiermark is? Graz. 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 All right. Thank you. And Arnold Schwarzenegger is from, okay, from the Steiermark? He's very famous in Hollywood. <laughs> yes. That's right. And he was the he was the governor of Arkansas, right? <laughs> okay. Anyway. Okay. So here these are just more, okay, more examples of what kind of what kind of NATO holes under these again? Alt Alsea. So that's very important to use the word ad because it has the bristle. And now, everyone will know what a bristle is. There are a lot of people that don't know that word. Okay. Um, the wear ladle hosen. Yeah, don't know. Would you ever see a pair of Bavarian ladle hosen with a bristle? No, it doesn't happen. Usually. Could you get a pair made by them? Sure. Yeah, you could go to like Engelbert Eichner and Beatrice Garden, who has that rivalry with Stan Gassinger, right? They hate each other's guts, but he made a pair for you. Okay. Okay. And of course, um, hey, I just turned <laughs> I turned 20 years old uh, back in March, and I for the third time, <laughs> and I gave these to myself. Um, and it only took um, three months. Wait, how long did it take to make these? Three and a half years. Now, did he work on them for three and a half years? No. So why did they take three and a half years? Wait. There's a wait list. Remember there's one of those questions that I wrote, how long does it take? During that, that, does that mean when you like walk away from here today and you're like, I need to get my later hosing because it, it's going to take three and a half years. I learned that in the presentation. Is that, is that what's going to happen to you? No, because you could, you know, you could go to, uh, I don't know, you, you, you could go to somebody, you could go to like, uh, um, Hans Stöger or his son Simon Stöger in, in Piking in the Pfaffenwinkel and they would probably tell you eight months, okay? Or you could go to Engelbert Eichmann, Beth is God, and he would probably tell you like, oh, one and a half to two years, or you could go to, you know, Walter uh, Hechner in, in München, and he would say, oh, you know, about a year. Everyone's wait time is different. The reason why this guy's wait time was three and a half years and didn't change during Corona, even though a lot of events are canceled and people buy they don't always need to go to places like Oktoberfest and they couldn't go, was because, why do you think? Any idea? Because he was so highly sought after, okay, that people said, I don't care if there's no Oktoberfest, I want that. The heart wants what the heart wants, right? Uh, I was hoping that people would actually drop off so I wouldn't have to wait the entire three and a half years. And I never waited that long for any pair of later hosen, but I waited that long, and boy, was I happy when it got sent. Okay, came to my home and took the day off of work. Because I don't want to be there. I'm, I'm not letting that, that package stand for one second um, unguarded, you know, when the post, you know, when the post office person drops it off. I took the day off, you get that. Um, 140 hours of labor. Now, what do you, why do you imagine it took 100, what took that many hours? The Stuttgarai. Because when you make a pair of Lederhosen, to assemble them, you cut all the pieces and s assemble, you, um, you, you know, zamane and you knit them together. That's how many hours of work. Does anyone know? Times two, times 10, I'm sorry. It's about 20 hours. You add on the stitching, those were 120 hours. When you buy Bavarian lederhosen, such as what he's wearing, which is, that's, that's a pretty, that's got a lot of detail in it, but they would spend, for this, they would spend a maximum 30 hours to do that. That gives you 50 hours, which is why, and you could calculate it, typically you would pay maybe close to, well, between two and 3,000 euro for those. This was a little more expensive. But hey, I had three and a half years, and I'm rooming with somebody here, and he gave himself, he bought himself a BMW for his birthday. So I don't feel that bad. Okay. Here we see the Ecknovit, and this, on the right, there's a design template. How do they get the design on the Lederhosen? Does anyone know? It's chalk powder. And then, what do they do? Okay. They brush it off and then they go and it sticks there and then they use what we call gumi arabico, which is a dissolvable, it's like rubber-like product, um, to do the stitching and that disappears by itself after they complete the embroidery. So um, here you're, we're just going to see some additional samples. Um, this was also kind of a 
Leberhosen dynasty in the city of Bad Alsi. His name is Reich. He doesn't have any kids. But he does have an apprentice, and the apprentice will take it over. Um, so the nice thing is that tradition of Lederhosen being made in the city of Bad Alsi will not die out. And here's a woman. So do women make Lederhosen? Yes, absolutely. There are several of them, even Bavaria. Anyone know there's one in Bavaria that does or has? She's, yep. she's actually quite old now. And how some? And what is her name? Frieda Mika Hayat. Right. And what famous? And her father, his last name was Lichtenauer. His name is Fritz Lichtenauer. So she took it over from him. And I hope that that doesn't die out because she is, she's not young anymore. Um, okay. So this group now, this woman is only in her twenties, so she's got a long way to go. But she makes very beautiful. Um, if you look at the one on the right hand side, you notice, or you can sort of see that it has hunting motifs. Um, this, and what style is it? It's an Alt Alsea. But it actually combines styles because typically in Alt Alsea they don't really have hunting in animals. It's pretty much all foliage. So where do the animals come from? A neighboring locality, which we'll talk about. So. Um, the neighboring locality is what we call, if you look at the top there, you see this word called Enstala. Does everyone see Enstala? You see the word Tal in there, so you know that that's a valley, right? Um, the Enstal is along river. a river which is called the Enz. And the interesting thing about the Enstal, which is really close to Badal, say, in all these places, is that the emphasis with respect to the stitching is on creating animal motif and hunting patterns without all of the decorative seams. So it's very, very um, seldom that you'll see, it's not unheard of, but typically what they are emphasizing are these relief stitch patterns where you see hunting scenes and animals. And this is like, it's really amazing and I wish, uh, again, the um, yeah, the visuals here don't do this justice, but there's a deer there, there's a hunter there, there's, a, there's an eagle there. Um, you don't have, again, the decorative side scenes. Um, and you also notice that it's very typical. Um, you have a vice a, a vice upschluss, this, um, sorry, English. I mean, English is my mother language too, why am I forgetting? <laughs> but the Einfassung, you know what Einfassung of English? Well, anyway, the end of it, you see, okay, it's, you know, it's... The edging. There you go, the edging. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's the weird thing about speaking language. Yeah, because so, so, so I speak Chinese, too, and I can always remember the word, um, you know, I can't think of it in English, no, the Chosha abstract, there you go. The Chinese word always comes to me first, which is Chosha, rather than the English word. And I get stumped. What is the English word again? In German, it's easy, abstract, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, anyway, very typical. This one was kind of interesting because this is from the this is from the Enstal, but it features eleven scenes, which is typically unheard of. And the eleventh scene, or the I guess you would say the tenth and eleventh, are Yishkevai. Okay, um, it's a process I'm totally unfamiliar, but that's deer horn. So how they get it in there to create that design, which is kind of in green right here, I I do not know, um, but it would be interesting to find out. Okay, so here are some more examples um, of Enstala. Now, this is from a town which is outside of Graz. And Graz, of course, we, we all mentioned that Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger came from outside of Graz. This is from a city called Köflach. And um, that Köflach is also the Geburtsort of this Lederhose. So these were actually made, they weren't even made in, in Alsace. Um, but there is a tailor whose name is Christian Sabetz who lives in Köflach um, and he makes them because they're very popular and he became a Zeklermeister as well and does beautiful work and comparatively speaking they're very inexpensive which is why I bought them. Um, he made this beautiful vest for me for my birthday that has, is anyone familiar with Kreitstich? So cross-stitching, so if you have your bomb beagle on your Tottenhemd, 
hand embroidered. Typically, they use cross stitch. So that's what all of these designs were executed in, cross stitch. Um, but they make a very special kind of beta hosa that is only made and presented to, to somebody who in the community has done some kind of outstanding contribution. Because you can't order that. So I thought this was kind of interesting. Now, if you look at the little mesa sock, okay, the side pocket there, you'll see there's a horse on it. Is anyone familiar with the Lipitsana? Horses? The Lipitsana horses that are in the Austrian riding school are raised in Kovnach. That is the symbol of that town. Okay. Then we go to other areas around Bada. I'll say this is from Goiza. There are also some differences um, on here as well. Um, and you can also see what's sort of interesting on this one is you look at the picture on the left and the right, what they're wearing. What do you notice is interesting? Those are not Schneeschlumpfe. They have a very particular, you could call it in, in, in standard German, Weiße Unterhosen, which are, they're like long johns. I think the German word or the Austrian word is Gatti or Gatti Hosen. Yeah, Gatti Hosen. Um, and that was a tradition in Aokim Ausseerland. Um, you won't find that, that, unfortunately, that is gone. They don't wear them any longer. At least based on what my Zekla friend who made these, when I asked him, did they wear them? I, mean, I, I had to call him a few weeks ago to say, I'm doing a presentation in Ohio and I need to ask you questions. So I wanted to make sure I got all the answers from him. So, you know, I did my homework, you know, until yesterday, you know, yesterday when I was still talking to, you know, the Vorstag from the Verein around Tegenze. And again, what's really important um, to point out. I um, mean, I'm going to say this, that by looking at a pair of ladle holes, and you cannot always tell where it's from. In many cases, however, or based on just the design. But what will give it away is how the designs were executed, what the shtikerai looks like, maybe the patterns of the shtikerai, the cut. Um, and the cut is very important. The size of individual parts of the Lido Hosen, those are characteris characteristics which will help you determine where it came from. Here, if you look at Stiker I, anyone familiar with Lido Hosen, especially Altausen, okay, I'll say Lido Hosen, knows that this came from Christian, or, or came from um, Sepp Klein, because this is exactly how the stitching, and he doesn't do the stitching. In many cases, Zekla have what we call, what do you call a person that does the stitching? A shtikarin, right? And one thing that's really important about a shtikarin, where did they go to get training? Anyone know? They go to a zeklerai, the makes later hose, and they say, I want to learn how to do stitching. Later, and they, they give him a few, some materials to practice for maybe a month, maybe two months. And after that, they have to start giving them work. So you might end up getting a pair of ladle hose in and have a sticker in that's only been there for three months. And what do you think your ladle hose might look like compared to somebody that's been doing it for 20 years? Will you notice a difference? Yes, definitely. Um, and so if you do buy ladle hose in and you're going to make an investment, um, What's one question you want to ask? Hello, Mr. Kurt. How many Stickerin do you have? Which one has been there the longest? Okay. Um, can you please have that person do mine? And you better hope to hell that they don't get sick and stop halfway through. Because if they stop, that means somebody else has to take over. And like your signature being different from the next person, the way somebody performs that stitching is going to be different. You will know. Because I approve. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Happens to the best of us. <laughs> okay. um, so anyway, if you are familiar with the second styles, then you can usually look at a pair of ladle holes and somebody would look at these and pretty much see it's been cut this way and the lats here, if you see this lats, it is really yeah, I can compare this here. You can compare it to these. 
and you see that this one looks wider. Mm -hmm. Or how about on this pair of God? Where are these from? Where are these from? These are Bavarian, right? And you look at the size of this, much larger. Um, and so when you view a pair like these, where the lots are so small, that usually lose very, leaves very room, little room for shtikarai. And that's why, at least in Aseyalat, this style typically features no shtikarai on the Latzpot. But it was my birthday, I said, can you do anything? Yeah, well, I have a few things. I'll send you some, you know, some patterns. We've got some patterns. I'm going to take this, and that's what they, you know, they ended up doing. Anyway, um, I always like to talk a little bit about this sector. <coughs> His name is Woody Daxna. He took over from his predecessor, whose name is Peter Ahama. He's an Obed Österreich in Ebensee. If you bought a pair, I would love to have a pair, but I, I could be dead by the time I got them, because the wait time it's about 14 years. Now, I had a friend who called me, because initially it was 12, and he said, I just talked to him. I ordered these nine years ago, and he said because one of the women that was helping him doing the embroidery can't do it any longer, so now he has to do it all his, on his own, and it's extended the wait time by another four years. <laughs> Can I call your guy? He said, yeah. Did he quit yet? No, but he's going to quit soon. You better call him. So we called him and he got an order in before Seth Klein and made these um, is, you know, before he retires, which is probably going to be in about two or, you know, three years. Works on the rest of his orders, won't accept any more, and, you know, that's that. Um, but the reason I like to show this, not because he has this incredible wait time of 14 years, but because, and you can't see it, it's really sad, but all of the shikarai here, everything is so three-dimensional. Um, it is just amazing, amazing work. Particularly, you'll notice that on the side decor decorative scenes, that everyone is okay, very, very much embossed. Um, and you'll pay through the notes for them. But hey, you've got like 16 years to save, so <laughs> that's less than a thousand dollars a year! Come on! <laughs> Um, anyway, I also like to show this picture. Does anyone know who Konevat Malkna was? He opened up the first Burger King in Austria. Okay, well, he was a folkloristo, so he was a folklorist. Um, it's interesting. I mean, um, his family. Okay, he came from a uh, you know his family was uh, you know business family in Vienna. They spent their summers spent their summers in Ausseeland. And he grew very, very close. Um, he was Jewish. Um, but he grew very, very close to the people around Alsace and just fell in love. Fell in love with the culture, um, the dialect, song, the clothing. Um, and he started collecting materials. And he wrote all about them. He wrote two volumes of a, a Tofton book one of which I have, which goes from like 1780 to the present, because there's one that precedes 1780. Um, it was printed posthumously because he, he died, um, but he put together all this really wonderful material. And he also went around, even though this is unrelated, but um, he, put, uh, he put together a Lieder book, um, Steirische, Steirische Volkslieder, yeah. I mean, this wonderful book. Um, in, yeah, Steirische Volkslieder, Styrian folk songs. You could get it. It's like, I think it's like close to $2,000. You could find it on, on Amazon or something. I've always thought about getting it, though. Anyway. Um, but those were his later ones, and, and they belonged to a friend of mine who, f who found a relative in the family and bought them, like, two years ago. Um, so, wow, that's a stuk, piece of history there. Um, anyway, we look at Oberösterreich, which again, now we're, we've left the Steiermark, right? Oberösterreich, which typically features, uh, you can get an Altasse of Lederhose, that's the Füssel, but it also has Hirschhundknöpfe for, for deer horns. Um, and there are other, okay, there are other interesting styles there. There's, okay, Ischla, um, Mark over Österreich, and this is one from Bad, okay, from Bad Ischl, um, which is in uh, Hanadere, who's also a member of our Verein. 
um, who hails from Wien, um, has spent many summers in Bad Ischl and probably could hold a, um, a, a you know, day-long presentation and tell you about all the wonderful things, culture-related and talk-related that have to do with Bad Ischl, but we'll have to leave that to the next Gau Fest. When it'll be may, I have, may I have just two sentences? Yeah, I'll come. Yeah. Erzherzog Johann and Mautner have helped the region in Bad Ischl and Umgebung and Salzburg that they finally came up with all the different vegetation and where self became self-sufficient and so self-sufficient that they came with corn cover from, from Austria. So that was the Erzherzog of Johann and Mautner. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. So anyway, this is, okay, this is Ischl, and you can see some more examples. And now I am kind of going to kind of go through these rather quickly because we haven't got to which area yet. Baya. Baya, yeah, got to talk about that. So I'm kind of going through the rest of this. This is actually a page, which is interesting, from that Trappen book that Malcolm put together that documents the color of, of stitching um, from 1800 which later on it became green, but initially in the Steiermark it was also white um, and changed at some point, but I don't have an exact date for you. Other examples of Alsea Lederhose, Rundose. Now, this last one about Austria, can anyone tell what kind of stitching this is? It's not a really good picture. Is it relief stitching? It's actually Plastikare. It's Bavarian. But what do you notice about the Leos? Oh, they got the They had a whistle. They were actually made in Austria. They were made by an Austrian. Um, and I talked to the family. I actually had talked to the Zekla, who lives in, I think he is in St. Johann in Pongau. Um, and I said, how is, this, right, how is this possible? And he said, well, my grandfather immigrated to Austria from Bavaria. And his wife, who was from Graz, uh, and did a lot of handicrafts, did a lot of stuff with Plotschtikarei, but not on Lederhosen. But she was given this pair, and that's what she did. So it's kind of like a contradiction in styles. And this is about, these are about 90 years old. So I thought, wow, that's cool. And it's a good segue, because now we go into, we go to buy it. Now, of course, it's important to point out that historically, and if you look at examples here on the left, this guy's wearing what we call historische, historische Tracht, right? Historical, um, you know. Costumes. No, you can't use costume. That's something we wear you on Halloween. The French words, okay, that might be true. Um, I'm still waiting again for the later hosen that are, you know, black with orange stitching with, you know, witches on brooms and pumpkins and whatnot. Um, I just like to use cultural, you know, historically appropriate cultural attire um, to describe the word taught. Um, anyway, all stitching, all relief stitching initially was relief. Or, God, that was something really redundant. All relief stitching was relief. Well, all stitching, all embroidery was relief. That's how it started in the late 1700s, early 1800s. That is what was employed. And so that's what was predominant, which you saw everywhere, um, in Austria, in Bavaria. Does anyone, anyone ever see this picture before? I bet some of you have. Yeah, Where's it from? It's from Das Große, uh, Das Große in the Hustracht, and it came out in 87. It's the very first documented proof of a pair of Lederhosen, that this guy's wearing, you can't see it well, that, that supposedly is Flachtikarei. Because before that, there, there was nothing. So what does that tell you about um, when Plachtikerei came on the scene? In the latter half of the 1800s, latter half, probably well after the Biedermeier site, and the Biedermeier site was from 1815 to like 1848, um, so the latter half of the 1800s, before it was, didn't, okay, didn't exist. Um, here, when you look at these, then you go, oh, okay, ich bin jetzt wieder da home, I'm home again, right? Because this is what you see. This is what most, uh, you know, most people that come to Wagalfest, this is the kind of Schmickerei that they're familiar with. It's what you see most of. Um, anyway, we call this Plachtisch on its sort, but it is an umbrella term for hand-ordered Lederhosen Bavaria. 
Um, we talked about the kind of um, you know patterns uh, that uh, you would see. You know, oak leaves and uh, ivy, grape leaf patterns, goats, deer, you know, eagles, um, even awahan. Um, you could even get like a wildschwein, you know, a wild, you know, wild pig. Um, now, here's the thing. Uh, initially, you would have patterns of, you know, embroidery patterns that probably would originate with the original Zeppelin. They had to draw them, then they create a template with them, um, and then they do those patterns on a pair of lederhosen. Um, so that, so if we assume that Karen here um, became a Zeppelin and then did all these patterns, and you saw lederhosen with those patterns uh, that Karen did. Uh, and then you saw a bunch of other, you know, you, you see these all over the place. Uh, could you assume that every pair, maybe 40 years later, came from her? No, because people steal secrets, trade secrets. Yes, they get around, you know. Maybe this guy here, you know, was wearing one of the pairs, and then Walter over here says, I really like those, but she charges too much. I'm, you know, I'm going to go to... Uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go to Ed because he only charges half of what Karen, you know, Karen charges. Can you do this? Yeah, no problem. Okay, that is the reality. Um, when you see a lot of these patterns today, some of them may have been copied, some of them may not have. Where that hasn't been the case is Austria, um, because for them it's more of what we call a Handwerkskunst, handicraft art, where they respect the. Um, you know, the, the time and the effort of that person that created it, and they'll say copying it is, it's a crime. It's, it's a crime. But, but no official protection to There is person. no copyright, there's no copyright, um, there's no patent, you can do it, but it's kind of like the unspoken, the unspoken rule. Yes, but there are people that do that, and they get, I mean, I know people at the Skull Fest that bought things, that where the designs were copied from somebody, I'm not talking about later Ozen, um, and those people found out, and boy, were they pissed. And I would be too, because how long does it take you to create a design, whether it's for a later Ozen or you know, a, a Ransen? That's, that's and, and it also becomes your trademark. Exactly. And so you wouldn't feel good if somebody you know, stole that from you. And it's, it's, it's the same thing. But that's a pretty much ubiquitous um, situation. But a lot of the times, you can tell, and I'll show you examples of you know where that okay where that is the case. Um, so again, there are other characteristics of lederhosen that will tell you who made them, and those are things like the zuschnitt, basically how it's cut, the shape, size of the lads, the style, the style of the of the knife pocket, how it's embroidered, um, and that will you know um, help you sort of come to um, come to a determination of yeah. who made them. Um, now, I always like talking about this particular um, group. They're from Kreit, and you can't tell what they're wearing because you're too far away, picture quality isn't good, but you can tell the two people in the front are wearing lederhosen that you've seen before, and I've really talked to death about this, and what, are, what, what do they look like? They have a bustle. Now, where, where do you find little holes that have a bustle? In Austria. In the Satskamabu. Yeah. So, how in tarnations do these end up around Tegansay? The world would like to know. <laughs> Me too. Somehow, there were, there were some connections, and a Freundschaft, die existiert hat, some kind of friendship, or they were visiting and said, boy, you know, these lederhosen, to use a current term, are really bomb. I want to get a pair made like that. And that took foothold in this part of Bavaria, around Kreut. But it's, you know, they're the only ones, really, that have those. Uh, because by and large, and you'll see another example on the far left of that pretty red circle that I'm good thing I don't think, I don't design lederhosen patterns. Um, you should see me do a cat and a dog. Um, maybe afterwards. Do we have a whiteboard and dry erase markers? Okay. Um, anyway, that's that looks like it came from the Satskamaku. It says, Dear Sean Knöpfer, 
everything. It's you know green relief uh, embroidery, but it was made in Bavaria. I can tell you exactly who made it because you see when I look at this Nessa Tasha and these little designs up here, um, I know that it came from Ferdinand Mozart because that is his style. If you look at most of his later hosen, um, it carries over, carries over from one from one to the next. And here you see more examples of it. Leda Hosen from Gleich, and I called the guy yesterday to ask him, where did the influence come from? Well, they've been wearing them for a while, and I can't tell you. Um, that up is worthless. And he didn't even have what's up, because if you use what's up, most people in Germany use that, it doesn't cost anything. You could, you know, you could see each other, and you know, they could call him on the phone, it cost money, and there was an echo in the, you know, the uh, lobby upstairs, somebody spilled their coffee on me. Anyways, now we go to the Alboy. Now, in the Alboy, what's kind of interesting about the Alboy is that they wear lederhosen really, really short. Now, I was talking to somebody else today because, you know, lederhosen trends change with trends in just general fashion. And back in the 70s, what kind of pants were you wearing in the summer? Hot pants. Hot pants. How long were they? Not, Not very. very. Exactly. And lederhosen in Bavaria which traditionally had been very long, when even past the knee, changed to adapt to those changing, um, you know, uh, exactly. you know, the changes in fashion. Um, and I was talking to somebody this morning because I had seen a pair of Lado Hosen that somebody was selling that were made back in the 70s. They were, okay, they were embroidered, and then, they, and then things started changing. I, and he went to a tailor or to a Zekla and he said, Take these and make them shorter for me. So what did he do? They cut right through the embroidered pattern. <laughs> right through it. <coughs> we're selling it. I mean, and it had been changed, you know, we're talking like 40, 50 years ago. But that's what was popular. The things people do to look good and fit in. Okay? Sacrilege, I know. Crazy. Um, the interesting thing about the alloy was it was less about the fashion and more about what was comfortable and easy to wear based on the terrain, mountainous terrain that they had there. It's still the same today. If you look at alloy on Lederhosen, they're always, okay, they're always very short. These are actually very short compared to something like mine, which mine actually goes, below, it goes over the knee shiva, okay, just over the kneecap, which are traditional, old, um, and again, when you look at the Bundhosen, ain't got no, ain't got no embroidery, do they? I like to use double, and triple, and quadruple negatives just to see if you could figure out if I mean yes or no. What <coughs> what I'm saying, just to keep you on your feet. I, I'm lecture, I'm telling you about this, but just the same way as I teach. Okay, sort of making, and I lie fifty percent of the time because telling the truth is really boring. And it's a line which makes things more interesting and colorful, right? So, if it, no, <laughs> this was all 100% spot on. <laughs> okay, so here's another picture. Does anyone have a pair like this? Typical album or need a buy them, right? Um, now, when we talk about, well, how can you tell where Lederhosen are from in Bavaria? In many cases, you can't. There are some. Um, uh, I guess some things that will signal and let you know maybe which area they're, they're born in. One thing is like the color of the Stikerei, but that's not an absolute. If you look at the Isagau, right, so groups such as Polach, right, groups in and around München, um, or members of the Isagau wear predominantly yellow. I say predominantly because, again, there are always exceptions to the rules, right? Um, and so these are these are two Vereine. I think that's yeah, that's um, Altenrösel from Allah, and they wear theirs are yellow. Um, this is oh, this is a really great slide because this is Alt I was just talking to um, Mark McCourse last night because we were talking about um, uh, in, you know um, <laughs> their their lovely purple vests, which they. They see this group wears a purple vest. It has two cutout sections so that you're you're easily able to see the um, the, the steg, right? Um, they got a special cut made in velvet, um, and they're purple. 
Now, if you look at their website, they talk about the purple color, but there were different um, explanations as to why it's purple. Well, we were friends with this other group from Yafanau, and they wore like uh, you know purple Schwenzigwand, so maybe it was taken over from there. But there's there's other explanation that well, we made it purple because we didn't want green, and everyone wants you know everyone has green, and we want to be different, and so no one knows. But Mark said. Yeah, after I had uh, gone to make these for me, people found out, and I heard from all, and they gave me hell for this, and so, yeah, there's all, this, you know, all these really interesting stories here, but, you know, again, this is yellow, I didn't even talk about the best, but I always kind of find these things interesting. Um, Max Werfel was a manufacturer in München that made a lot of data hosen for, you know, for Reine in, in our uh, Galfabank, going back to the 60s and 70s. This pair was made for Washington, yeah. Long, long time ago, it made it's made, made its way back to Germany from from the United States. Um, and here is the current Sackler, who took over for Max Gerfel. His name is Walter Heckmann. Um, and again, he has his own. If you look at his later hosen, they have their own special kind of tailoring cuts. Um, I I mean personally, I said uh, they're okay, but they're you know they're not my favorite, so I never bought any from him. Um, but a lot of others have. This is Friederika Heil. So there are also people in our Gaufverband that, um, especially, um, you know, Schneeratalerstamm, that wear Lederhosen that um, her family made, and those are her Mitarbeiter. And she also has a very, very particular cut. If you see her Lederhosen, you cannot mistake them because the stitching is very, very unique. Um, so if he's where, yeah, I mean, later on, when everybody gets up here and stands on the table, and we're going to go around, oh, your later hosen from, is from this person, yeah, you'll be able to tell. What are you wearing today? I have mine on. Oh, darn. Because my, my, my Lichtenau uh, went out. Okay. But I was looking at him, because to your point, they stuck an eye. I mean, his pants kind of remind me of his. I'm not sure if he's wearing A little bit. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a very loose stitching almost. It's, it's not as uh, sharp as others are. It yeah. doesn't mean it's not my style. It's just, it's just a style. To be, I'll have to admit, I used to have a pair when then people said the, the you know the eagle looks more like a pigeon. The deer's head is just a triangle with a dot in the middle, and I didn't feel good. And you know what? I ended, I sold it. <laughs> um, but you know, you like what you like, um, and and you know, in German we say die Geschmäcke sind Tastes different. So, um, anyway, this is also from Friedrich Ahaya. Does anyone know what kind of Lego hosen this is? You should. This is an Alsea that is worn by people in Kuwait around Tegernsee because she is also one of the people that makes them. And they're actually very nice. Um, I, I would buy a pair. Um, but, you know, again, when, when Karen was talking about the number of aprons she was going to bring, and I was talking about the number of ladles that I was going to bring, and even though I have close to the number that she brought, I have to come from California. I didn't have the luxury of, like, driving my car. Otherwise, you know, maybe I would have all 14 here. Okay. Anyway, um, you might know some of these people here, and they're wearing Lederhosen from Frida Mika Hyatt, except for... The last person on the right, and those are made by a machine, right? So you really can't tell who's in. Then we have some Miesbacher toddlers, so these are people from Miesbach. And this is the Moser family, which is a very old secular family in, okay, in Miesbach. And the one style that you might, okay, that you might see on, well, we'll have to find some on there, you're not going to you're not going to be able to see it, but you can see he makes a variety of style with um, Rydichtikarai and Klatschtikarai. And this was the grandfather. And he made this pair in 1950. That's what it looks like today because it was never worn. And it landed in the hands of uh, Christian Eichelmüller, who owns a tannery in Miesbach and sells a lot of them. And I buy a lot of Lederhosen for him that we don't use in our Ferrari, and I have them sent to Pittsburgh because we did a really good deal on them. Um, and Kristen's a nice guy, and he goes around Upper Bavaria, and he buys old Lederhosen, and then he, sit, he like washes them and sells them. Um, but he has these two really what we call a Prachstück, 
in a Feldstück is something which is like this exemplary, exemplary pair. And if you look at the relief stitching on this, it is, it is absolutely exquisite, absolutely exquisite. Um, and um, yeah. So then we go to Otterfing, which, you know, I mean, no real reason for me to include this, but their Stikerei, of course, is yellow, and they're, they're in Oberland, right, which is in the Wiesbach area. So just to show you that uh, color is not the sole criterion for trying to figure out where a pair of later hosen is from, because they wear yellow all over the place. Anyone know where they don't wear yellow? There are specific places where yellow would be, pretty, much, pretty much would never see it. Yeah. <coughs> well, not not completely. There are exceptions. In Vandekazaland, in Vandekazaland. So if you are familiar with Garmisch Partenkirchen and in Bud, the predominant color for for um, Stickerei there is green. But there are four different shades of green. Which one is it? We have Moosgrün, which is almost a yellowish green. We have Hellgrün, light green. We have Grasgrün, which is grass green, and we have Dunkelgrün, which is dark. And this one is most blue. This is the lightest color of green that almost looks yellow. They don't wear these. They wear, it's traditionally been grass green. Do, would you find other colors there? Sort of, but by and large in Vereine, it's all grass green. Um, and yellow, fine anyway. Now, the reason I included this is because if you look at this Lederhosen on the left here, this, do you notice anything interesting about it? Besides the fact that it has green relief, sti relief stitching. One. Yeah. What about, but what do you know? Do you notice anything about the cut? The narrow. The narrow. Okay. If you look at the slot sport, this is a very, very high cut. It measures eight centimeters. Typically, the average is five. Um, if you look at the Leisto, the lot, okay, the Leisto, this is very narrow, and it flares, it flares out. Um, and it's interesting because I emailed this Verein to find out, um, like five days ago. For, I just added the pictures this morning, like, this morning, <laughs> this morning. I could probably continue working on this for the next few years, and I'll never finish. Um, but this Verein is located outside of Augsburg. Now, Augsburg, would speak what dialect? Do they speak Wunisch, Bavarian? No, it'd be closer to Schwäbisch. The Verein is in a place called Führingen. And Führingen, they used to have a Zekla, and the Zekla's last name was Bergmann. And there were about 50 people, maybe two or three or four, that did these until 1980. And then that was the last of their line. So they went to this other Zeckler in Rotenbuch. In Rotenbuch, there was a Zeckler there named Magnus Heiden. And they said, hey, our Zeckler died. Can you make these? This is our tradition. And Magnus Heiden said, well, OK. And he did. And a few years ago, I met his son. He came out to our Verein in Anaheim. It's an Oktoberfest because he was playing with the Blaskapella. And I said, ich hab schon bei euch was bestellt. I ordered something from you. Um, Willst du denn die Säckerei übernehmen, wenn dein Vater nicht mehr kann? Are you going to take over the Säckerei? No, that's just too much trouble. It's, it's, it's you know, <laughs> forget it. Um, and a few months ago, his father quit. And that was it. And so that is the end of the story for these, unless, and I said, why don't you contact Hans Stürger, who is in the Waffenwinkel, and maybe they'll do it for you. Because otherwise, that's when there's some, nobody there to continue it on. That's how it goes away and dies. And it would be sad because there is no other Verein in any place in Germany. This is one of these particular types of Lederhosen where when you see based on really the cut, um, and I guess the stitching more so on the left pair because it's so close together where you can tell this is where it's from. This is the region it's from. And I remember back in 1999 when I was at the golf fest and Karen Dean came over to me and I, I had ordered two um, Gaufonik, and one of them was from the Schwäbische Gauverband. And I was leafing through the pages, and I immediately saw these letters. I said, wow, these look really weird. And I remember it from back then. Um, so, yeah, but that's.
that's what happens. Anyway, you can see the Thuringia you know, Tafla from this group, and you can see their beta hosen. Now we get to Deesin. And Deesin is in the, okay, the Amaze. Now, what do you notice about their beta hosen? It's relief sticker. It's relief sticker. If you go throughout Obabaya, um, almost all Trautenvereine wear Lederhosen that have Platsch, right? Yeah. Platsch Tikkerei. Almost all of them. Um, because again, after they started the Trachten in the 18, 1880s, that's what became popular and it spread like wildfire in the um, the Vereine that continued to wear relief embroidery um, were, you know, few and far between. Um, so, in Diesen, and I contacted a few days ago, while he was still over in, in Germany, I contacted Seth Keindl. Um, actually, I wrote his son, Magnus, and they said, what can you tell him? I'm doing this presentation, what can you tell me about these? Can you tell me about the influences, the history? Talk to my dad, and his dad, Dr. Doug, got some information and sent this to me. Um, and I included it, and these go back to you know, the latter 19th century, and it's very unique because it's white stitching. Um, it doesn't have a knot's point. It goes straight up, the Leiste goes straight up. Um, they have buttons on the side, silver coins, which is very particular. Um, and if you look at the seams, all of the seams are tailored. Seems they're all inside. That there's no one second knot on there, which is very particular. So if you see somebody wearing these, there's no way you're going to mistake where that person is from. So I you know, thought that was very cool and unique. And of course, there he is, and he was playing the um, his siach today for the uh, you know people that are participating in the press plateau. Um, that is the uh, that is the zone that in the middle of the so the foundation side and right over over there. Um, now the other thing you talk about um, with later hose and we're talking about specific individuals are people at least in the history of Bavarian later hose and were very very um, that really stood out for their style for the beauty for the uh, fact that they considered it kind of an art form. One of them was um, Josef Maya who was from Prien in the Kimgau, if you can, and there, there are old ones that are in circulation, if you can get a pair, they'll set you back a few thousand dollars. They're all used, uh, but they're so highly sought after that you know, people are willing to pay um, you know, a lot of money for them because his, the stitching was beautiful, the, um, uh, I would guess the you know, dimensions, the proportions, if you look at how he cut the, the lots area, you know, the lots area, um, honestly, I think guns talk and now I mean just um, you know very very detailed, very exact um, in, in the type of stitching. These are examples from um, some friends of mine that own these and sent me pictures and everything from Joseph Maya and you don't need to look at this and you don't need to look at this. Then we go to Topton Poro, which is in the Kingau. In the Kingau, very close, but does this look anything like Joseph Maya? No, totally different. I mean, I would never, based on what these look like, I would not like them. They, for me, they, they are not, they are not very attractive, but um, the way they're cut um, and the way, the way they are embroidered. Um, then we go to Bactus, okay, to Bactus Garden. And Bactus Garden, again, is an interesting area where um, we have primarily two families. One of the predecessors, the predecessor of the Stadt-Gassinger family, who started that business, his name is Hans Goetz. This was, if you saw this, anyone that's familiar with Lederhosen from Bavaria would see this and say, that was from Patrick Scott and that was from Hans Kurz. Um, even though it's kind of yellow. And yellow is not the color for Patrick Scott. They wear the color which is hell blue. It's like green. It's slightly darker than what he's wearing there. Um, these are from Eigner. And when you look at Eigner, do you see any characteristics? Because I'm going to show you a pair from Steingassing and his rival. How would you tell them apart? Some look very, the, the um, pattern of stitching on the left pair is very, very similar, almost identical to Steingassing's. But what other things would you look at that might help you determine? Yeah, you could look at the best of Tasha. You could look and see how certain things are cut. But I'm not going to tell you right now, but now look at this. Um, 
And these are, well, this is also from, this is from Aika. He copied a pair from Yusuf Maya. This was a copied pair. So he, he said, oh, somebody brought him to the side, hey, can you make this for me? And he did. So that's it. Um, and these are also from Aika. So Aika, who's in, uh, but what style are these? You would find these where? In Austria, right? Find these in Austria. Um, and so, here's, so these are Eigner. These are, I don't know how these people, these two other people got in the picture with me, but they did. <laughs> okay? Now, this is from Steingassinga. Steingassinga, if you look at this pair on the left, does it look like Eigner's that you saw before a few slides back? Here, we can go back a few slides. And here, this was, see, did they see this pair? Now we go, we go back to this one. Look, is it the same? No, it's a curvature of those. It's different. Exactly. It's a curvature of, of the bicycle. This is round. You see the roundness here? Okay. Uh, that gives us weight. And also, the design pattern in the bicycle, in that area, um, which is very unique. And you, you know, you go back to the Ica pattern, and then you see that's different. Okay. The bicycle, the shape, the curvature is different. Um, and so those are things that help you determine where they're from. Now, that's Stangassinger, that's Eigner. Those are nearly, nearly identical. They copy, I mean, basically Eigner copied Stangassinger. Maybe that's why they hate each other. Um, okay. And here's a very interesting, now if you see somebody wearing these, there's no mistaking these are from Berchtesgaden. They have a certain name. It's called the Sirkehosen. They're worn in the winter. Um, <clears throat> and then, some of you, and you find these around here, you might go to Eagle. Now, Eagle is a Gebarai. And a Gebarai, what was a Gebarai again? Was it a snack bar? A, um, a fabric store? A uh, hot dog stand? Or a tannery. Or a tannery. That's right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, they're a tannery. But of course, they can make money making lederhosen. They don't make very nice lederhosen. I think the stickerai is absolutely a horror. Um, it's, it's, I, but they're cheap because they're a tannery. And for people to buy them because they can shoot plot with them and it doesn't really matter. They didn't cost a whole lot. But this is just to demonstrate that, you know, you can find a lot of different styles and a lot of different grades, okay, different grades of quality. And you see that, um, who is that? Okay. Yeah. 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 You ever seen him before? Yeah, is that the guy from, like, St. Paul or something? Is he? I <laughs> <laughs> saw him before. Don't want to see him all of them. Anyway. <laughs> okay. And then we get a Hans Sturger. Now, Hans Durger is also um, provided uh, or supplied data hosen, for example, to, um, let's see, um, Freine in Aarkau, for Land, okay, was particularly to uh, Wisconsin, Oberlander, right? Oberlander, Milwaukee. Brick Michael did it because Highland was gone. Yeah, okay. And of course, during Corona, I felt sorry for them because. They only had a two month wait time, which meant they went from having one and a half years of waiting to two months because all the events had been canceled. So I said, well, that's really sad. I'll order a pair. And then I had about five other people get them too. So it helped them out a little bit. Um, but also their, you know, their work is, is you know, very, um, you know, they have a very particular style and cut and this is, you know, those that you see up there. Is, is that a um, must? Is that design specific to Sturger or specific to a variety? Well, this particular design that has we call this dry bumps, you'll see it in a ver different variety of of, ex of executions. Um, so the dry gums is not exclusive to Sturger, but the the, uh, the the pattern of their oak leaves is kind of particular. Yeah, because all you have to do is say, "Hey, I live in 
you know, hey, I live in Baptist Garden, but I really like them. I heard they're good quality. I'm going to go over here. As a Ferrari. As a Ferrari. Even for Ryan Smith there are, there are no, to my knowledge, um, established um, rules as to where you can where you can get them from. So, for example, if you go to like Ad Miesbach in München, some of them will have Walter Heckner do them. Um, some of them will go elsewhere to have them done as long as they're being done in yellow. It's it's kind of you know it's kind of fine. I think you know one of the things that um, created that situation was of course before when there was less transportation available, and um, you know as a variety you would go to whoever was more or less local. Um, you know it doesn't. I don't think you'd find any um, bylaws that state you know absolutely have to have this particular design. Um, I mean, it could have been something that was just uh, passed, you know, you know, it was an unspoken or, you know, it was not written uh, sort of regulation. Um, in Garmisch Partenkirchen, you have two localities that um, during the 1930s were kind of amalgamated into one, but they remained um, fiercely independent when it came to Tracht. And so if you go to Garmisch Partenkirchen, in Garmisch, uh, it's Grasgrundstickerei, which would feature things like gums uh, and animal motifs. In Padenkirchen, no animals are allowed. None. Um, and they typically have, for all of their Tachtenteile, for parts of their Tacht, they also insist on having a different name. Um, so typically, um, the short socks, which the, I, I guess the, the general expression is Lofel. But Lofo is also, um, it also depends where you are. Some people would use the word <coughs> Stutzen, some people would use the word Babel. Stutzen would be better because Babel means it's hanging around the calf area. And if you say Stutzen and somebody's there from Austria, they're going to assume they're, uh, they're wearing what I'm wearing, which are the complete sock, right? Um, but in Garmisch, um, they call them, uh, let's see, they call them Fosen. Posen, in a partnication, they call them Hiesla. Mm -hmm. And Hiesla is also the name they use in Mittenwald mm -hmm. for the same, you know, kind of half sock. And if you go to Baptist Garden, it's got another name, Wurhizel. Um, so it depends, it depends where you are. So anyway, this is Stöger. Here's some more Stöger. That guy is, he was just in, oh, no, he's, he came to 12, 12 minutes and got bored and left. Now it's because he had to go do some prize prize about it. But here's some more examples. And here are some more examples of Schurger Edelhosen. And here's the last example of Schurger Edelhosen. And the last slide, hallelujah, of this presentation. And he copied the design of Josef Maya in the Kinkgaard. So that just, you know, just shows to go you that designs alone are not the sole criterion in determining where they go with them from. And you know what? I'm done! <laughs>